So, I, you know, I'm going to answer this question. It's not heart related, but I think I think it's a good question. Um, can gluten cause back pain? And the answer, simply put, is yes. It absolutely can cause back pain. Um, another question coming through on on an autoimmune condition, MS, multiple sclerosis. Yes, uh, I've directly seen gluten induce multiple sclerosis. Remember, one of the side effects of, of gluten, one of the big side effects, um, there are research studies that show that in some cases, you know, greater than 50% of those with gluten sensitivity are vitamin D and vitamin B12 deficient. Vitamin D deficiency has been linked to MS. Vitamin B12 de deficiency can lead to a reduction in the formation of the myelin sheath. And so there are actually sometimes there are cases where, where uh, if, if particular cases where B12 deficiency is the reason the numbness, the tingling, the motor strength, and loss of, of strength is, is actually happening as a result of the B12 deficiency induced as a result of gluten exposure. So MS is definitely one of those linked to, to gluten. Okay, I like this. Angeline says, what is heart disease? Are high blood pressure and high cholesterol heart disease? No, they're not. You know, um, that's real, man, that is really a great question. What is heart disease? Heart disease is generally, it's inflammation to the tissues in your cardiovascular system. So it could be directly inflammation to the heart. It could be directly inflammation to the blood vessels themselves. So, when we talk about high blood pressure or hypertension, is this directly heart disease? Yes and no. Um, it, it, it can be caused by inflammation, so in that regard it is. But is high cholesterol heart disease? No. Uh, I, I think what we could say is that research really greatly supports that hypertension or high blood pressure is a risk factor for... For you know, if we're talking about cardiovascular disease, we're really we're talking about stroke, heart attack. Um, these are what most doctors would consider to be kind of the end dangerous forms of heart disease. It's the, the stroke, the heart attack, those types of issues. High cholesterol is not a disease. You have to understand. What, I started practice 20 years ago. Cholesterol, normal cholesterol was 280. Okay, since since my beginning of, of a starting practice, it's been lowered from 280 to 250, then again from 250 to 220, then again from 220 to 200. Well, who made the decision to lower it? Largely, the companies, the drug companies that sell statins. And here's how that happens. It, it sounds like a conflict of interest. You wouldn't think that the companies that actually sell the drugs um, would have any say in what is considered to be normal or, or, or abnormal cholesterol. But in, in, unfortunately, the FDA goes through this process where they grant waivers. So what they do is, is you know, Merck, I, you know, and I, I don't really want to accuse any particular company. So let's just say, the drug companies put their doctors in panels and they, they petition the FDA to say, look, our doctors are experts on the topic. And even though they have a conflict of interest because they work directly for us, we want you to grant us a waiver because they are experts. And so the FDA does. They grant waivers, even though it, the conflict of interest is huge. And this is why the number's gone from 280 to 250 to 220 to 200. What this actually did is it increased sales of statin medications uh, billions and billions of dollars. And, and again, I, I think you have to look at this with a grain of salt because the, the actual empirical data on lowering cholesterol, meaning there was a study published not too long ago that showed in, in women, I think it was women over the age of 60 or 65, don't quote me on it because I, I don't remember what the age, exact age group was, but that they took these women and, and their statins and they crunched the numbers to see did taking the, the statin actually reduce their risk of developing heart attack or stroke when compared to women who weren't taking them. And the answer of this research study, which is one of the largest non-drug funded studies of its kind ever performed, showed that there was no benefit. There's also research that shows that people with higher cholesterol tend to live longer. So if you're asking me whether or not I believe that high cholesterol is a form of heart disease, 
The answer I'm going to give you, my opinion of it, is no. High cholesterol is not heart disease. Now, there are, there are types of high cholesterol. We get that cholesterol gets up over 350. This is where I would consider, uh, you know, looking at, you need to aggressively look at lowering that because this level of cholesterol can be a risk. There's actually a condition called hyper, uh, hyperlipidemia, and there's a, a familial genetic type of hyperlipidemia which elevates cholesterol and, and it's very hard to control, which is why cholesterol lowering medications were created in the first place was to treat these kind of more rare genetic conditions of people who had greater risk for developing heart disease as a result of very high cholesterol. But, you know, we get into these numbers, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we know that people under 300, uh, but under 300, but above 250 live longer than the general population. We also know if you get your cholesterol, especially men, if you get your cholesterol below 150, we get depression, increased risk of suicide, um, and that's not good either. So I think, it, you know, I think you have to consider the history of cholesterol and how we came to understand what is and what is not normal. So when you ask me what high cholesterol being heart disease, I would say, yeah, if you're shooting at this level, then yeah, it's, it's definitely a risk factor. But if you're kind of down in some of these ranges here, I would say probably not something I would look at uh, as aggressively or, or consider to be a great risk, at least not my opinion and the opinion of many other researchers and doctors across the, across the world. Um, let's see here. I think I, I answered that one already. Let's scroll down. How much methylfolate? Juan wants to know. So if you're trying to get your homocysteine down, um, a good place to start is between 800 and 1,000, uh, 800 and 1,000 in terms of folate, and that's micrograms. Um, but again, it's, it's, you know, my advice to you, Juan, would really be make sure that you're following up with your, with your doc to have your homocysteine levels measured. It's pretty safe to take 1,000 micrograms of folate. With, without any risk for major complication or side effect, and it doesn't really interfere or interact with any medications. Um, as well, as far as B12 is concerned, um, you know, B12 anywhere from, you know, 2,000 to 5,000 would be adequate. And if you're talking about B6, anywhere from 20 to 50 milligrams would be adequate to, you know, to help combine those three to help if you're trying to push your homocysteine down through B vitamins. Karen, I, I can see your question about what about oatmeal. Again, I'm going to refer you back to the Glutenology Masterclass. If you're asking me that question, that means you don't really know the actual definition of gluten, and I want you to get that information. And it's too complicated, it's too long to discuss in this short forum tonight. Uh, it's, remember, the, the Masterclass is going to be a five-day class with 14 hours of information. So um, we really uh, got to get you educated. So make sure you sign up for that. Okay. Sorry, I'm reading these questions to see which ones have um, pertinence here. So Lily's asking about, um, she says, Hi, Dr. Osborne, been following your no grain, no pain for over a year and love it. Um, recent blood test shows iron at 226 micrograms per deciliter. All other, I'm mean, assuming you mean CBC, complete blood count, are in range. Any thoughts? Uh, there are a lot of things that can elevate iron. That 226 is not astronomically high, but there is a condition, Lily, um, where iron levels are, are, can be elevated. Um, it's genetic, and the best way to treat it is to get with your doctor. If you, if you have their, you know, again, it's, a, it's, an, it's an iron storage elevation disease. And the best way to get rid of it is to actually donate blood periodically. Remember, too much iron in the blood can create oxidative damage, so you don't want to let it ride high for too very long. Uh, let's see. Uh, scroll down just a little bit more. Should everyone with autoimmune diseases but not heart conditions supplement with CoQ10? Not necessarily. Um, but Dolly, I'm a big believer in, in testing 
Um, so again, you can have your CoQ10 levels measured. It's, it's a relatively easy thing to do. Just when you visit with your doctor, ask them, don't, don't look for serum CoQ10 because that's not super accurate, but you want to have them measure your lymphocyte CoQ10, your intracellular CoQ10 levels because that's where CoQ10 works. It doesn't work in the blood. It works inside your cells directly. Let's see here. Um, do oxalates release histamine? No, that's a kind of an offshoot question. Um, oxalates don't really release histamine. So if you're following a, a low oxalate diet, you don't necessarily need to also be following a low histamine diet. You get take it a little bit too far and end up starving yourself to death. So you got to be careful when you start mixing those restrictions between oxalates, histamines, etc. Um, let's see, this is another one. I'll answer it only because some heart diseases can be caused by viral infection. So the question is, what antivirals do you recommend in general? If we're talking about antivirals to, you know, nutritional antivirals or antivir or um, nutrition to support your immune system to combat virus, um, number one on the top of the list, hands down is zinc. Um, you know, and if you're looking for high quality zinc, look no further than glutenfreesociety.org, especially if you're trying to avoid any type of cross-contamination of gluten. Uh, number two would be quercetin, because for that zinc to get in your cell, it, it needs something to help push it into the cell. And quercetin, which is a bioflavonoid, um, is, is a zinc ionophore, so it opens up the cell wall uh, for zinc to get in. Number three would be NAC, N-acetylcysteine, very, very potent antiviral. Number four would be vitamin D, um, also vitamin A. Interestingly enough, those of you that um, are following you know, COVID-19 right now, uh, in Thailand, they just approved, uh, the government in Thailand just approved using a, a plant compound called andrographis uh, for the treatment of COVID because that's what they're finding over there is effective. Now that's not a proof for treatment in the U.S. So I don't want you know I don't want you guys to think I'm telling you to treat your COVID with with andrographis. I'm just sharing the news with you there. But um, on that same note, I have a I have a formulation that's called Virid, and it has andrographis and vitamin A, and it has zinc and lysine is another you know supporter of of the immune system through viral uh, shutdown. And uh, it also has elderberry, which is another really great natural plant-based product that has fantastic antiviral properties. So, I mean, there's a lot of really good, strong things that you can do to support your body's ability to better tackle viruses. Uh, let's see here. Uh, question, when is the masterclass starting? It's starting on the 22nd, so a couple weeks away. Um, so mark your calendar, February 22nd. It's it starts on that Monday and goes through the whole week, Monday through Friday. Uh, let's see, keep going down on that left side. Kelly's asking, I'm wondering about heart palpitations. It feels like it thumps at the end of my exhale. I'm grain free. This came out of nowhere, had COVID in March. Hope it's not that. Well, first thing, Kelly, definitely you wanna follow up with your, with your heart doc and just make sure it's nothing major. Um, but a lot of times what, what I've seen in, in, in people nutritionally where they have like a palpitation or an increased, uh, increased heart, uh, not so much heart rate, but increased force of that heartbeat um, is things like magnesium deficiency and calcium deficiency and CoQ10 deficiency. I also see that same symptom sometimes in people that overconsume caffeine or don't get enough sleep or where the, sometimes the thyroid medication might be too strong. So. Those are all just potential possibilities, but you should definitely get it checked out. Uh, Gene's asking, how can I lower my calcium score in lipoprotein little a on a plant-based diet uh, or a plant-based diet? No, um, lipoprotein A, so if you're, you know, lipoprotein A is a type of lipoprotein. Now, lipoprotein is a, is a form of cholesterol and um, lipoprotein A cannot be altered by diet as far as anyone has studied. Uh, there's no research, lipoprotein little a, okay? You can't, a plant-based diet will not lower it. 
Right now, here's what we believe. We believe this is the one form of, of cholesterol that's truly genetic, meaning that no matter how you alter your diet, um, you're not going to lower a high level of lipoprotein A. Now, I have seen case studies I can share with you. I've seen uh, a few people do carnivore and actually lower their lipoprotein A. That's the opposite of a plant-based diet, but I don't necessarily recommend a carnivore diet, you know, long-term indefinitely, and especially I don't recommend doing it if you're not, if you don't have any guidance. The other thing I've seen marginally lower lipoprotein A, and again, this is just, this is just case study, okay, and that's vitamin C. So, you know, again, the primary belief here is that this is one of those markers that we just don't know enough about how to lower it. Vitamin C, I've seen do it. Carnivore diet, I've seen do it. Um, the, the carnivore diet is the only thing I've seen actually normalize it. Vitamin C, I've seen 10 to 15 point reductions in it, but nothing, um, nothing that I would say would be therapeutically worth doing to justify uh, using massive doses of vitamin C. I like this one. So, um, can eating gluten cause one to cough within minutes? It can. As a matter of fact, Starboard, that was my symptom um, for gluten, was I had a cough. Every night I'd go to bed after dinner, I would cough for like 20 minutes before I could settle. Uh, that was one of the main symptoms I had when I discovered in my gluten sensitivity almost 20 years ago. Um, so cough is definitely one of those things that, that can be caused as a result of the inflammation, uh, both in the back of the throat, but also in the airway. Sometimes it can create airway inflammation that leads to coughing. Uh, Elizabeth asking, what time of day is this master class? Elizabeth, it's, it's, um, it's about, the class is broken down over five days. It's about three hours a day. You can access it all day. It's free. You can access uh, each three-hour segment, Monday through Friday, um, at any time, at your leisure, at your, at your own schedule. Um, let's see. Does supplemental calcium increase the risk for cardiovascular disease? No, there's no great evidence that shows that calcium increases the risk for heart disease. Now, that being said, there's actually evidence that shows that not enough calcium can increase the risk for heart disease, but not so, not so much too much. Now, Let's, let's just use a little common logic, though. If you're using high-dose calcium and you don't need it, which is what some people do. A lot of people go to their doctor, they're told they have bone loss, so they start using high-dose calcium. And if you don't need it, that calcium is in your bloodstream, and your body's got to figure out what to do with it, right? So sometimes it's going to put that calcium, it's going to deposit it into your, into your vascular tree, into your vascular tree. Now, this is one of the reasons that you know you don't want to just take high dose calcium without you know some type of formal measuring of whether or not you need it but vitamin k is important to help push calcium into your bones and so if you're taking high doses of calcium it's probably a pretty good idea if you're doing that that you put in some vitamin k uh, as well as vitamin d these both tell calcium where to go. So again, um, high dose calcium, not, I mean, calcium, taking calcium supplementation, not necessarily dangerous and creating heart disease, but again, not doing it in a manner that's not justified, you know, yes, it can lead to, to some deposition. There's some research that shows that, you know, vitamin K helps calcium not quite deposit as aggressively in your blood vessels and helps push it into your bone where it belongs. So hopefully that answers your question. So Yumiko, I read that gluten is linked to keratosis pilaris or KP. After months on a gluten-free diet, it hasn't resolved. Depending on how many months, it may not resolve. It may take six months to a year for that to resolve if gluten is what's causing it. Yes, I am aware of the link, but it's, KP is not just caused by gluten. It can be caused by a number of different problems nutritionally. Omega-3 fatty acid deficiency, vitamin C deficiency can contribute to that as well. So um, those are things that, that, you know, you might also ask your doctor to check you for or look into. Ernie wants to know how long it takes to get gluten out of your system. Minimum two months, but, you know, more likely six months. So this is why people that give the gluten-free diet a, a, like a, like a, you know, a single toe in the, in the cold end of the pool, like they kind of dip in, but they don't really dive in. 
that they don't get better or they don't find that it's helpful because it takes several months for gluten to get out of your system, especially if you've been eating it for long periods of time. Remember, 20 parts per million, that's one breadcrumb, can cause an inflammatory response for up to two months in some individuals. And so that, that needs to be something that you're aware of. If you're trying to justify embarking on a gluten-free diet, don't do it unless you plan on committing at least six months. If you don't, uh, the, the outcomes may not be what you want them to. And that's where a lot of people, if they don't get their outcomes, they quit. So um, hopefully that helps you out. Can cold hands and feet be a sign of heart problems? It can, it can be. Um, and I would look toward your pulse rate. Um, and you get this checked out by your doc as well. But you can measure your own pulse rate. If your pulse rate's high, um, if, you're, if your blood pressure's high, if you're getting heart palpitations, those are all kind of additional signs that you would want to pay attention, attention to, Jane, that you know, could indicate that your heart is playing a role in that cold hands and feet problem. Because remember, your heart pumps the blood to the distal extremities. And so if, if you're not getting adequate blood flow to the distal extremities, it could be a sign of, of your heart being too weak. It could be a sign of your uh, heart not functioning properly. Uh, let's scroll down on that side a little bit. Yeah, iron deficiency definitely, Sophie, affects heart health. And iron deficiency is the number one deficiency associated with gluten sensitivity. We didn't even put that up on the board tonight, but iron deficiency causes anemia. Anemia means basically you can't carry adequate oxygen through your bloodstream to the tissues that need it most, like your heart. And so what can happen is lack, lack of oxygen through iron deficiency anemia can actually increase your blood pressure, can make you tired, can make you exercise intolerant. Uh, and and all that, so all those things can be problematic. But yes, iron is definitely can be linked to, to heart problem. No, Ricky, I don't. I don't think lipoprotein A is related to gluten immune repair. Um, I've not seen that be the case, and I've measured lipoprotein A in individuals for 20 years um, as it relates to their gluten-free diet. It's just not something I've seen correlate. Maybe somebody somewhere else has a, has a different idea about it, but not, not in my experience. Uh, the ideal daily dose of vitamin B12 depends on whether or not you're deficient in it. Um, but again, you know, anywhere between two and 5,000 if you're trying to get you know, a strong dose supplementally in your body. Um, and and you know, the best way to take B12 is in lozenge form if you've got a history of gluten sensitivity because gluten damages the area in the stomach and in the small intestine that help you absorb vitamin B12 appropriately. So, if you take a lozenge, you'll absorb it through your cheeks and bypass those damaged areas that might not be at full capacity in their ability to absorb the B12 that you're, that you're taking supplementally. So if you're taking like a pill, like a capsule, it might not work as well. Best way to lower triglycerides um, depends on why they're high, Susan. But one of my, in my experience, one of the most common reasons why they are high is excessive carbohydrate in the diet. Not excessive fat, excessive carbohydrate. So it's really to rein in your carbohydrates to somewhere you know, around a, making sure that your carbohydrates are not greater than a third of the total caloric value of your diet. So um, we call that the rule of thirds, a uh, third carb, a third fat, a third protein as your, as your caloric intake. Let's see, go down just a little bit more there on the left. Um, what's the healthy alternative to lower blood pressure other than diuretics and BP meds? <laughs> the healthy alternative, Deborah is very simple. The healthy alternative is exercise, eat real food, don't eat processed food. Um, if your blood pressure is still high and you're already doing those things and you're overweight, then it may be that you need to transition your food caloric intake down for a time to drop some of the weight that, that is creating the elevation in pressure. If your pressure is elevated as a result of nutritional deficiency, then it's a really good idea to have your doctor check you for nutritional deficits. So that if you need some type of nutritional supplementation to support that, then you know what to use. Otherwise, it's, it's anyone's guess. But th those are the easiest, quickest, and in my opinion and experience, extremely effective. Uh, it's very, really very rare that a person, in my experience, needs to go on a blood pressure medication if they do those things. And the research backs that up and supports that as well. Um, Lisa wants to know, if you've had a parent who has had heart disease, are you doomed to have the same heart issues? No. Um, so, and, and 
That's a really that's a good question. So in science, we have this. There's this debate that's been going on for decades, and maybe you've heard it, and it's referred to as nature versus nurture, right? And your nature is your genetics, right? Did you inherit bad genes? Uh, or did you inherit, nurture, bad behaviors? So most scientists actually now officially agree that genetics play about a 20% role and choices play uh, an 80% role. So if your parents have a, a true genetic risk for heart disease, you, there's still hope. Generally what happens is parents can have a genetic risk and pass that on to their, to their offspring, but they also typically have bad nurture. Um, uh, I don't want to call them bad parents, but maybe they were just uneducated about these types of things and didn't really understand that, you know, that it was a bad idea to eat hydrogenated oil because doctors years ago were saying eat margarine instead of butter, right? So there's a lot of nutritional faux pas that have occurred over our history. But it's the, the teaching, nurture is the teaching, right, of our children. This is why it's so important to impact our children with good behaviors today. But look at, if, you know, look at as an example, if a parent says that school lunches are okay, that's nurture, right, not genetics. And so they go, the kid goes to school, eats the traditional school lunch, which is loaded up with fructose and, and gluten and other garbage, and they're not healthy. That's not genetic. That's choice. And that's why many of you may have heard me oftentimes refer, a lot of you have gotten mad at me in the past for saying that, look, heart disease is a disease of choice. I don't care who you are. Unless you have a true identifiable genetic component, um, then it's, a, it's, it's truly a disease of choice. Now, your choice may be being made from a, a place of good intent, meaning you may be making a good choice that you think is a good choice, but you know, one man's food is another man's poison. And uh, you may, you know, everybody says how wonderful and heart healthy it is to eat, you know, rolled oats, right, or, or oatmeal, that type of thing. But if you're gluten sensitive, that's the worst thing that you could do. And it's not going to be necessarily heart healthy for you. So, again, um, what you think might be the right choice that you're making might actually be the wrong choice, in which case um, it's part of how you were raised. It's part of how you were brought up. It's, it's the lessons that you learned. And so that nurture part is just, is, is much more important than the genetic issue. Um, is it dangerous to have low, low blood pressure? It depends on the person, Nancy. Some people, you, you have to understand too, blood pressure, you know, the smaller the person, the, poten the greater the potential that their blood pressure is going to be lower because there's less overall blood volume, there's a smaller being, right? So it depends on the size of the individual, their exercise. Like my blood pressure is, is pretty low, but I'm also, I train regularly. If you exercise regularly, you work out regularly, your blood pressure is naturally going to come down. And, you know, a lot of doctors, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old and a lot of doctors, you know, would measure my blood pressure and say, you know, I, I can't believe it's that low. That's just because it's pretty standard for people in their, you know, close to their 50s to start having high blood pressure because of accumulated bad choices over time has led to weight gain and led to other problems. So um, don't, don't necessarily look at it as low. I, I would say where low blood pressure could potentially be a problem is if, is if you're dizzy all the time, if you're lethargic and lacking energy. Um, that would be where having low blood pressure might actually be a problem. Brittany is asking about counteracting histamine. The best way if you're doing it nutritionally and trying to support the stabilization of histamine release is, is through, to actually have a formulation called Histocyst, which is a mixture of vitamin C and quercetin and N-acetylcysteine and bromelain, which are natural um, nutrients that support mass, what's called mast cell stabilization. They stabilize the, the, the membrane around the mast cells, which are the types of immune cells that release histamine, and so make it uh, a lot less aggressive when you do have a histaminic response. Um, Chucho's asking, well, that's a COVID question. I guess I'll answer it. Elderberry, can elderberry trigger a cytokine storm? Not seeing it happen yet. Um, we've used tons of elderberry, Chucho, so um, I think whoever's stating that is stating that from theory um, and not from actuality. Uh, 
Uh, let's see here. Does one accidental gluten ingestion cause villi to disappear? No, it doesn't. Um, multiple of them do, but not one. Let's see, do I think fructose can be the cause of bloating if it's not from gluten? Um, it can be, fructose and other FODMAPs. FODMAPs are you know, hard to digest or difficult to digest carbohydrate components of food that oftentimes cause bloating. Uh, gas and bloating in individuals if they're not gluten sensitive, but still struggling with like an IBS problem. Okay, let's see. Do we have any other heart questions here? I want to make sure I try to get... Uh, too much calcium can cause plaque in the vein. Can too much calcium cause plaque? I think I answered that one already, Wendy. As far as kidney stones, it's not so much the calcium causes kidney stones. It's, um, it's excessive calcium. And the, the, the times where we see excessive calcium uh, are even not necessarily from calcium supplementation as much as we see excessive calcium from vitamin D deficiency with kidney stone formation. Because when your vitamin D levels are low, um, you have to understand that your blood calcium levels are regulated very tightly. There are a lot of different systems, your parathyroid, your, your, um, there are other hormones that really tightly help your body regulate your calcium levels in your bloodstream because if they, if they differentiate too greatly, it can kill you. It can cause a heart attack. And so what happens with long-term levels of low vitamin D is your bone will start leaching calcium into your bloodstream. And that's because vitamin D helps you absorb calcium from your diet. So if you're deficient in it, you want to absorb calcium from the food that you eat effectively. And so then your parathyroid hormone will increase, telling your bone to release its stored calcium so that the bloodstream doesn't run out of calcium. Because again, low calcium in the blood can kill you. So that, so that being said, um, to answer your question, uh, I think, well, I think I just answered it. Um, it's not so much that high calcium causes kidney stones as much as it is low vitamin D can cause it an abnormal elevation in calcium over time. Uh, when the parathyroid hormone elevates as a result of that. Okay, so we got more questions, but we're out of time. So look, hey, if you like the show, give me a thumbs up, give me a like, make sure you help me with my mission. We're trying to get this information out to as many people as we possibly can. And there's never been a stronger time of censorship for natural health care. We've, you know, I've been censored this year a number of times by big tech and, and, uh, and social media platforms. So the best way that we can share this information is by sharing it, right? So copy the link, paste it, uh, send it to a loved one, send it to a relative, someone you think that, that, that could help be helped by this information. Again, our goal is to help save 100 million lives. And we can only do that if, 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 um, if you guys help me share this message because again, the censorship has never been greater than it is today. That being said, if you want to avoid the censorship, if you want to get updates from me and you want to learn uh, more from me, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org and sign up for our newsletter there. It's the world's largest gluten-free newsletter and sign up for it. It's absolutely free. When you sign up, we'll send you a bunch of free bonuses, a gluten-free starter kit, among other things. And, uh, and you'll just be in the loop and it'll be a lot harder for my information to be censored from you. So if you sign up for my email, it's a lot harder for, for you to get that censorship. So if you want to keep receiving, I definitely encourage you to do that. Hey, thanks for spending your Monday evening with me, and I hope you have a fantastic, healthy week. We'll see you back here next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.